Today I'd like to talk about change. And uh, recently we had a person come to the shop and he was he's an advisor to large corporations. We're not a large corporation, but he came in to sell some silver and he talked a little bit about change. And he was saying that in the days of the cavemen that the amount of information in the world doubled about every 10,000 years and things have been accelerating. So like in the 1890s, you know, there were many advances in technology. It didn't take nearly 10,000 years to double the amount of information in the world. Well, today, to double the amount of information in the world, all the books, all the information on the computers, it takes an astounding year and a half. And it's accelerating quickly. And so we think that over our lives we've seen a lot of change. I think we can say we haven't seen anything yet. And change, some things are good and some things are not so good. And I'd like to talk about something that I'm not too happy about. About two weeks ago, we heard that Reed and Barton went bankrupt. Now, Reed and Barton has existed since 1827. They're one of the oldest manufacturing companies of any kind in the United States. And, you know, they went bankrupt. There, there's going to be an auction. It's not going to just be, you know, some little deal. They, they, are, they are gone. The last major silver company in the continental U.S., is closing their doors forever. The employees are out of a job. So I'd like to talk today about the Reed and Barton Company. As I say, the company started in 1827. By 1868, um, they had 800 employees in Taunton, Massachusetts, and they were a, a giant industrial company. This really cool book came out in 1998 for their 175th anniversary. And it has a lot of good information in the book. Some of the things I really liked, I marked here. Here's a picture, 1865, of the main building. And that you see the employees. There's hundreds of them out front. They're in all the windows, and they're even standing on the roof. It's amazing how many people work there. Here's a picture from Scientific American from 1879. Again, it shows many people working. It shows this gigantic industrial plant. It's all gone. And here from the 1880s is another picture of the sprawling industrial complex that was Reed and Barton. Here's a picture of the um, silversmiths working side by side. Looking at these guys, they look like they're about 12 years old. I don't think the, um, the laws were then what they are today. So anyway, Reed and Barton had three main things. Number one, they made silverware. Number two, they made hollowware. And number three, they made silver storage and silver care, like chess and polish and things like that. The most important division, of course, was the silverware. In the early days, Reed and Barton acquired the Dominic and Hoff Company. Much later, uh, about five years ago, they acquired the Lunt Company. And so they also made the products of Dominic and Hoff and Lunt. I'd like to show some of my favorite things that they made from the Dominic and Hoff era. Here's one of my favorite patterns. It's called Renaissance. It's from the year 1894. Here is a Saratoga chip spoon. It's got this north wind figure here. Then I love this great big sandwich tongs that, that they made in this pattern. Nice piercing. It's a pretty incredible piece of silver. And then these three are a real unusual thing. The pattern renaissance, and then it's enameled. Enameling was a rare thing in American silver, only done from the 1880s through maybe 
1910 or so. And one of the neat things about this pattern is that it's got this north wind figure in the front, or maybe it's a Renaissance man. But on the back, where you would normally have like some flowers or something, here is a great big bearded man. Now, and that appears on many of the pieces. It's, it's a really special pattern. Okay, another really neat pattern by the Dominic and Hoff division of Reed and Barden. It's called Labors of Cupid. The pattern was started on a momentous day, January 1st, 1900, to commemorate the new, year, new century. And so Cupid's, you know, for New Year's, pretty, pretty appropriate. There's 16 different labors of, of the Cupid's. It was all laboriously hand-pierced. This is a seafood salad set. And uh, there's a great big lobster on the top. And if you look at the tines of the fork, it sort of looks like a, a lobster, and that's the way it was made to look. On the top, you have, uh, as I say, one of the 16 different scenes. You have three cupids uh, by a table, looks, and he's making something in a bowl and serving it to the two cupids. And you can see he's using a spoon in the bowl, and you can see knives and forks on the table. And like sort of a good trivia question, I have heard that this is the only instance in American silver, and we're talking about 2,500 patterns, where there's actually silverware in the design of the, the, the flatware. So little forks and spoons on the table by the cupids. Okay, some of the other patterns that I really like, this is La Prisienne by Reed and Barton from 1904. Many people have said La Prisienne is the best Art Nouveau American pattern. The, uh, the way the pattern ends up at the end of the handle, very cool Art Nouveau look. The piercing is really good Art Nouveau work. So here we have a serving fork, and here we have, it's according to the catalog, a waffle server. Uh, that'd be a good question, too, because it certainly looks like a, an all sterling pie server, but according to the catalog, it is a waffle server. One of the most unusual, outstanding Art Nouveau patterns of all time was Reed and Barton's Love Disarmed. Okay, so there's other patterns with people on them, with Art Nouveau women, but none of them are as outstanding as how large a woman as on Love Disarmed. Started in 1899, was made till about 1915, and then brought back in about 1970 until 1995. They actually did a good job when they brought it back because all the piercing, like on this piece, which is a later piece, was actually done by hand. So. You have this beautiful woman, and then you have this Cupid with an arrow by her side. It's some of the, the best American silver. Green Barton's most popular pattern of all time, however, was Francis I. And it started in 1907, and they made everything imaginable. People collect Francis I, and you can collect this pattern forever. Here's a couple of pieces. Here's an asparagus fork, and here's a very rare piece. This is a gold-washed pea spoon pierced with flowers. And um, this piece was never reproduced, and so it's probably from around 1908 or so. One of the neat things about the Francis I pattern is that it has fruit on the top and then flowers, and then there's, again, like the labors of Cupid, there's 16 different motifs. So there's different fruit and different flowers on the various pieces. You know, it really was quite an invention in 1907 and quite a painstaking achievement that Reed and Barton accomplished here. They made other patterns. They made stainless steel patterns. They made silver plate patterns. But these are, I think, the best of what Reed and Barton did. As I said, there were three main divisions at Reed and Barton. The second one was the Hollowware division. And again, Francis I was their most popular thing. Here's a 
Francis I water pitcher. I've often said that the Francis I hollowware was the most popular hollowware of the 20th century. They made everything you can imagine. Tea sets, bowls, trays, candelabras, e-perns, punch bowls, you name it, they made it in great quantity. And again, there are, there are rare pieces within the um, Francis I hollowware. Uh, we recently had a giant pair of candelabras that were supposed to be one of a kind. There's a martini set that's really rare. The punch bowl and tray is really, really rare. So mm. people make a, a lifetime commitment to collecting Francis I hollowware. They made other great hollowware too. They made modern hollowware. They made Victorian hollowware. It was a, a big business. Okay, so the third business was their storage and polish business. And here's an example of their flatware chest. So until, for 200 years, until about 1990, Reed and Barton had a division in the United States here that made flatware chests. At that time, the, the uh, work was moved, unfortunately, to China. The division was closed. But I'm happy to say that the quality of the Chinese-made chess for Reed and Barton was quite good. And I'm happy to sell them. I'm not, you know, I think the quality is every bit as good as the American. So, so it, it's, it's, it's a good line that they have. The other line they had is Silver Care, and that's their Hagerty's division, and they make sleeves for, for flatware, they make polish of every kind, this is an aerosol product, they made tubes of polish, they made many, many things. I really think, I recommend it all the time, I think it's probably the best line of polish that there is. Okay, so what's, what's going to happen? You know, the plant will close, the people will lose their jobs. Lifetime Brands, who makes many other American silver patterns, is making things in Puerto Rico. Uh, they have offered $15 million for the rights to everything that is Reed and Barton. What I believe is going to happen, they will, you know, close the plant move production of perhaps five Reed and Barton patterns um, to Puerto Rico, maybe one Dominican Hoff, that would be pointed antique, I would believe, and maybe two or three of the Lunt patterns. So there'll be something left of it, um, but not much. Uh, I think that they will, uh, this is a very popular thing, the Hagerty polish and Silver Care. I think they, they will probably incorporate that into their line of products. But I don't think that the Reed and Barton chests will continue. They could, uh, but Wallace has their own line of chests. Do they really need another competitor that they own? Probably not. Uh, as I say, lots of change, some good, some not so good. Thank you.